company called Asbury Automotive Group. They're a traditional auto dealer. Um, they have a very innovative, I believe, board and way that they approach the auto dealership market. The, the, the auto market is a very fragmented market. It's basically serviced on a local basis by local dealerships providing automobiles to, to customers within those regions. Um, uh, Asbury is really good in the fact that it's, it's the auto dealer market and Asbury in particular do excel at this in that they generate so revenue sources from a number of different, different areas. They have new car sales, used car sales, service, and, and now they're starting to do sales online via the internet. What's really interesting about this business is historically, Asbury has grown by, by buying other, other auto dealerships. And so mm -hmm. probably about an eight to 10% historic growth rate. And what that's done is since the focus of their acquisitions have been in local markets, they've been able to realize very large economies of scale. So as the company has grown, there's been tremendous operational leverage because it's the way the auto business works is a, it's a very local business. If you, if you try to buy dealerships across the country, you're not going to get much scale. But if you can do it within a local market, you can get scale. The biggest that's not on the balance sheet that, that I know about is management. It's much easier to manage a group of people within a given region than to try to do it desperately across the country. And so that's one of the what, what, sort of the economies of scale that happen there. Now, the other aspect of, of, of Asbury's dealerships, which, which adds some appeal to it, is they have about 45% are luxury. And those dealerships have, uh -huh. a, have higher margins than the, the more commodity kind of dealerships. Both can do well. But the luxury dealerships is about 45% of their mix. You can actually see that in not as much in the US because there's they don't really break that out. But if you look if you go over to the UK, look at a company like Cambria, which is exclusively um, exclusively luxury dealerships to somebody like Virtu, who is primarily a mass market. They do have some, but you, the margin difference can clearly be seen there. Like yep. what? How, how much um, spread between the two types of businesses? Well, like in the UK, I think Cambria probably has like mid single mid single digit margins, and the in the more the the more, I guess they call I it. See. And the average dealerships are probably low single digits. So you're probably talking a a two to three percent margin difference. But given the scale of these businesses and where the, the an important aspect of an auto dealership is something that's inventory turns or what's described as velocity. The quicker you can turn turn cars, this is like a retailing business. Most retail businesses, the key aspect of it is inventory turns. Because if you can quick, if you can turn your inventory quicker than your competitor, you can offer cheaper prices, get a higher return on capital than you can. So that's right. That's part of what Asbury's appeal here is, is they do have very high inventory turns. And so compare their their, their main competition at this point are other local dealers that don't have the scale. So Asbury has the has the margin, gets the economies of scale from that, and they also don't have the turns. And so you get those two together, and what can happen is you can get this nice flywheel because as what happens is it has a tendency to feed off itself. More people get, they like the service, they like the local, the local service that's there, and it just grows and grows and grows. So that's sort of what's happened to Asbury. If you take a look at historically, that's sort of been their base model. What's really interesting now, though, is the introduction of the internet. Now you had mentioned in, in evolution, that that's pretty much how the business really sort of accelerated and really growth. It's all this internet-based stuff. Well, that's exactly what's happened with Asbury here. They, they have been another company called Lithia are sort of the pioneers in the, in I was called the traditional dealers in, using, in selling cars over the internet. And actually what's very interesting about Asbury is they started out with zero cars over the internet at the beginning of this year. Now they sold 10% of new cars over the internet. They expect to go up to 15% by year end. And these wow. are all customers that are within their local footprints that, have, that weren't previously Asbury, Asbury customers. So these are brand new customers within their footprint. They haven't even started to think about going outside their footprint because with this, with this um, you know, online model, basically the incremental cost is, very, is basically putting the software together and, and after that, it basically just becomes, you know, it, it's it, the profit, incremental profitability is very high. So this has been something, Lithia's noticed the same thing, Asbury's noticed the same thing. So I think this is, is gonna be a real big growth there. How this sort of works into their plan 
is Asbury is now expecting for the next five years to grow revenue by 20% per year with half mm -hmm. coming from the internet. You get the traditional eight to 12, 10% like they've historically done based upon this roll up and buying. They, they have a very good buy discipline. So they buy when it's, when it's, when they think it's right. If they, if, if they can't find anything, then they'll buy back shares. They have a very good capital allocation. They're very unique amongst auto dealerships or probably companies in general that they actually have a capital allocation committee. The whole job of the capital allocation committee is to set the priorities. And I've been talking with other investors about this. One investor put it really well in that they've defined it so well that in essence, the question is just execution. Mm -hmm. the ex basically, there they go out there, they basically set up the parameters. If, if, they, if you can buy the dealership for this amount, we can see these amount of synergies. We try to look for dealerships in our local clusters. Then, then, then that's a, that's our first priority. If we can't find any, we have excess tasks. Then we'll buy back shares. And then the but the first priority of all of that is the internet because of the high high returns. And they they introduced that last year to show you how much they're sort of focused on this. They had a previous system which was primarily focused on getting service appointments. They scrapped all the investment in that. Basically, at the beginning, the end of last year, they basically put together an integrated system which allows you to buy a car online. You don't even need to go into the dealership. All the all the all the the um, steps along the way you can do online. And if they need any wet signatures, they'll deliver it to your house and get your signatures there. So they've provided an offering that's comparable to Carvana in terms of an online offering. But then in addition, you've got a service person that's there. If something goes wrong with the car you've got someone that you can directly talk to. So, you know, one of the questions in terms of this business is, okay, is Car I mean, Carvana, I think, has its own sort of segment and it's going to do well with what it does well. But one of the weaknesses of that model is lack of local connection to customers. And that's what, that, that's, that, that's what guys like Asbury, there's a group of people that will go out and want to have the online experience, okay? Mm -hmm. And having that online experience that that's great. But then there's also a group of customers that want to have the in-person, the test drive, all the traditional. So what I really think both are going to coexist, but I think what we're really seeing now in some of these traditional dealers that have adopted the internet as a way to sell automobiles is we're, we're seeing the growth spurt. We've seen mm -hmm. it all along. Now we're seeing a turbocharge these companies. And the nice thing about it is the incremental margins are just gigantic because in essence, they got to set up an internet Internet. They set up the software internet aspect of it, and they're 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 not they're not their salespeople. Have, there isn't much salesperson to really has to do with it, and they can interface. So it's 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 an interesting time for this business. So I think the way the way, and that's one of the things I really like about the business is that is that going forward, people agree that the revenue growth is going to be there. The real mm -hmm. question is, okay, well, what's going to happen to profitability? Now, right. the nice thing about Asbury is that most of its most of its profitability comes from service. So it'll continue to service cars. The big question that people have is, okay, EVs are coming up. What's going to happen with service in EVs? EVs are more reliable than internal combustion cars. You're not going to need oil changes. You're not going to need all these lubricant and mechanical things that are part of the, that are part of traditional cars that are associated with the internal combustion engine. A very interesting answer to that. There's, there's two pieces of data I've seen. There's a company in Sweden called Bilia, and there's been EV penetration in Scandinavia has been larger than any other place in the world. And for those companies, what they've actually found is they found service has actually gone up. It's just been different things. Yeah. So in Scandinavia, the tires, for example, tires in all EVs go, go quicker than, 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 than traditional cars because of the additional torque on the wheels. And so that's, that's an example of a growth aspect there. So I think the market seems to be concerned about guys like Asbury sort of in declining businesses, but they've really gone out and really done a lot of stuff to enhance the growth. And what's really interesting is, okay, you got 20%, 20% revenue growth. They've had great operational leverage, which we'll probably get here. So you're probably talking maybe, I don't know, 25% plus EPS growth hmm. selling for less than 10 times earnings. So I think what you've got here is you've got the market conflating what specifically, you know, this business is versus what's really going on underneath the hood. And so I think that's, that's what really makes it interesting from my perspective is that 
is that it, right now it's selling for what a value investor would say, oh, that's a great price. Of course. Right. It looks very interesting. I think what's going to happen here, like you're saying, you had a good question. Okay, are we at a cyclical top? Well, we may be, but this guy has some more, more gas in the gas tank, per se, in the fact that it's going to continue, I think, to grow from the internet. And then as they continue to do acquisitions, they just did an acquisition at the end of 2020. And that's just being integrated in. And if they get more, it's going to be it's going to be incremental going forward. So I think overall they have a really good management team. They're incentivized correctly and they're 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 in an opportunity, probably very similar to the opportunity that you have with evolution, is a lot of these companies transitioning where you can get the internet as part of this of a traditional market, it creates a lot of growth. And, and that's mm-hmm. exciting for investors because. You know, you know, even as a even as a value investor, you can see the growth there if it, if it just continues on and moves along, like right. it has. So right, that's uh, you know, I was just curious. I mean, certainly the numbers look very good. Um, you know, what drives that inventory high inventory turn for them? And then uh, you referenced a couple of times about acquisitions, the one that they did recently. You know, what sort of typical acquisition multiples um, do they pay or how does that compare to where Asbury as a combined entity is trading? Yeah, I, I mean, it, they, they, they buy at multiples probably um, compare, you know, at or slightly below what their current price is, but they're able to take advantage of synergies. They're actually okay. able to actually realize those over time. Um, and they're very, they're very selective. They, and they're looking for, because what's happening is when you think about the dealership market, it's basically run by entrepreneurs that basically started these deal, dealership businesses after World War II for the most part. These guys are aging out. So the availability of these acquisitions is very, very aperiodic. And right. you have to be there at the right place at the right time. So these guys that know their markets that they're in, and when one comes available, they'll go ahead and do it. But they also have other options to allocate their capital if an acquisition doesn't happen. And the key things now is the internet aspect of it. And the other key aspect is um, the share buybacks. And historically, if you look at what they've done, they have been bought back a significant number of shares when acquisitions haven't been available. And so mm-hmm. they do, I think they've got a very balanced capital allocation approach from that perspective. I like the fact that they have a capital allocation committee. Um, I don't see that very often. I I haven't seen it in any other company. And I think it's a a legacy of, there was a guy that used to work for Michael Dell's family office and he's Mm -hmm. had that committee. He's no longer with Michael Dell's office, but he heads up that committee. And it's, it's very interesting. I think the key thing with inventory turns that I've seen in this business, a lot of it really depends upon are the salespeople focused on you know, trying to sell a car, trying to, what you want to do, you want to match what the consumer wants to the car. And if you've been able to figure out how to develop that process and do it in the most efficient way, then that's when the turns are going to start to click. And that's what the model is all about. I think these guys have done a very good job of matching. Okay. I know my customer, here's the car that he or she wants. And that's that. And there's a company actually in China. that's probably the best one that's they have inventory turns of like 15 or 16, but that's wow. what this is. And, and, and that's what I think this business is all about. Retailing in general is all about, right? It's matching, exactly. it's matching consumer to product. And part of it is sort of, you know, when you're dealing with retail, it's more distribution aspect of it too. But, that, but that's a key aspect of getting a high inventory turn, just understanding your customer and matching that. And then, and then just having it run through a very efficient sort of um, distribution chain. 